Uh, kia ora katoa. Um, thank you, Elizabeth, and thanks for the opportunity to join Dan in a conversation about um, the state of the Gulf. Um, this is, I think, the 10th uh, Haraki Golf Forum conference or workshop that we've held here at, the, at uh, Tamaki Painga Hira. And um, I'm really pleased to see this time there'll be some work at the end where we end up with some action. So it's more a workshop style, so you're not going to hear people talk at you for the whole time. Although this first session is a little bit like that. Um, so um, the, other, the other thing, um, I'm going to be talking about, um, let's have a look. Oh, how did I end up up there? <laughs> uh, several things. When I have conversations with my, um, with my scientific peers, there's two things that really come to mind and two things that really perplex us on how we can enact change because we can see that we're really in a bad situation globally. We've got several big issues and the two big issues that keep coming up in my peers are climate change or the impacts of climate change and also the, what we call a biodiversity crisis. And I know there's some resent, um, reluctance to use words like crisis and emergencies and things like that, but having seen the changes in my lifetime and when I talk to some of the old folk and what they've seen in their lifetime, we really are in a very different world than we were even 50 years ago. So this is a, something that's happened only over a period of two generations. And I'm going to take, a, first of all, a global perspective. 99% um, of scientists now are in consensus that climate change is real and it's being driven by human act activities, particularly around fossil fuel use, but other activities as well. Um, and despite the intractable challenges of trying to get change, and even looking over to the big west island of New Zealand, where they're having trouble of actually, de de they're in denial as well, because they're looking at their sectorial interests in trying to um, maintain what they think is normal, but in fact what's turning the earth into a very abnormal place. When we go to, to biodiversity, it's not just a biodiversity crisis, it's actually a biomass crisis. So much of our um, biomass on Earth now is here to support people, whether it's um, through, particularly through farming, but um, we've lost, as a result, we've lost a lot of our natural biomass. And these are the things that give the ecosystem some resilience and also um, help maintain our, our um, environment in a fairly stable state. Um, as you've heard over the last few weeks, the Amazon's burning at a, an amazing rate. And you also know that the Amazon is one of the um, lungs of the earth. And actually, the result of that burning will have impacts on um, the rate of climate change as well. So it's all quite dire. And in fact, we can, um, we can all sort of just stick our head in the sand and hope it goes away. But in fact, unless we take some action, um, not much will change. So I started at a global perspective, but I want to use the Hauraki Gulf as a microcosm of what's happening in the world, because all of those impacts that are happening globally are also happening in the Hauraki Gulf. When you look around, you, you know, the views from up here are fantastic. On a day like today, you can see um, Hotudu and, uh, Great ba and Aotea. You can see the islands in the outer gulf. And, um, and it always looks fantastic from the surface, but as a marine scientist and my marine scientist colleagues, we know that the changes that have happened under the sea have actually been dramatic and they've happened just over a few decades. And I'll be touching on some of that as we go. I'm really pleased with the Haraki Golf Forum that they set two major challenges, their goals, which is the 20% protection and also the 1,000 square metres of shellfish beds. It's really nice to see the focus shifting from the land to, what, to what's happening under the ocean because that is almost the invisible change that's happened and a lot of you I know are aware of these changes, but that's where a lot of the invisible changes happened, but it's not visible to most people. And we, and we need to make it more visible so people realise that the changes are very dramatic and we need to help reverse that. Okay, the impacts on the Gulf are many and varied. Um, from the, um, the State of the Gulf report from a few years ago, which a new version will be coming out in about 12 months, um, there were a number of um, environmental indi indicators of some of the problems with the Gulf, and I'm not going to go through all of these, 
but just to point out that all those are coming from the land, from the sea, and also by the activities that we, that we have on the islands and in the Gulf waters as well. And so there's no silver bullet that's going to solve all these problems. We have to solve all the impacts from all their sources to actually have some um, recovery possible for the Gulf and restore it back to the jewel that it, that it once was. It's still a jewel for some people, but actually it could be so much better. First of all, I'm going to talk about a concept of shifting baselines. It's quite pervasive um, in a lot of people's thinking that when they go out on the Gulf, they think that what they're seeing is actually quite normal. But it's anything but normal. It's actually highly impacted. Um, and again, I mean, I'm not going to talk in detail about sedimentation or, or um, fishing impacts or um, industrial impacts or any of those. But the shifting baselines concept means that over time, your concept of what is normal shifts as well. So it's only based on your own personal experience. And it's only when you get to my age or, you know, some, that you actually start realising that what I remember as a kid um, is actually very different to what it is now. Not that I grew up in the Hauraki Gulf, but I see it in the area around Melbourne where I grew up as well, in the rock pools that used to be alive with life are now just barren. Um, and what happens over time as well is that the large predatory species or the, the sort of top of the trophic scale get taken out preferentially and you end up basically with um, smaller and smaller fish over time. It has a big impact on the evolution of fish. They start um, having young a lot younger and, um, and also the, ma the major, another big impact is the biomass as well. The other thing is the trophic shifts can be so dramatic that in some parts of highly populated areas of the world have shifted from a fish-based sort of community, or at least visibly fish-based, to a jellyfish community, which is not something we'd ever want to go. So if you push it too far, you end up in a pretty awful place. And it's not just limited to um, parts of the world, it's happening right here in the Gulf. I um, In the 1950s, a four-hour day trip out on a boat would bring back some ridiculous number of snapper, all of which would, or the average size of which would have been larger than, than the a group going out now. So. That's the big shift that's happened in the Haraki Gulf. And I hear stories about um, the huge numbers of um, rock, um, rock lobster that used to be around from the old timers, um, the, the large numbers of hapuku that you can catch from shore. I mean, those things don't happen anymore. So that's, for, at least for your awareness, to realise that that shift has happened and the change has happened. And the, and the beaches as well are quite barren of shellfishes as well. So the consequence of those shifting baselines is that your environment changes as well. Um, the removal of um, rock lobster, for example, from most of the Hauraki Gulf. I mean, when I first arrived in New Zealand 11 years ago, I would go out um, free diving with, with uh, friends and we would see rock lobster regularly. It's only 10, 11 years later, I challenge anyone to catch a rock lobster at, at, with any frequency in the Haraki Gulf, at least a, a legal sized lobster, because the pressure on those is so high. Similarly for snapper, you know, they're only at about 15 to 18 per cent of, the of their original biomass. Um, that has a big impact on the ecology, and you end up with these things called barrens, then um, the kinna barrens, where there's no longer predators for the kinna, so what happens is all the seaweed um, basically gets chewed down by the kinna, and you end up with monocultures of, of kinna which have their place, but they, they dominate in some areas. You're really, I know you're a lot aware of a lot of these changes, so I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I just want to sort of highlight that some of these changes are right here on our doorstep. Some of the problems um, that, that make the impact so intense on the Gulf is that we have among the highest boat, um, private boat ownership in the world. I had heard it, it was the highest, um, but it's certainly very high. Um, and all those boats want to go out on some weekends and usually go fishing. Um, the catch limits that are possible within the Haraki Gulf are ridiculously high. I mean, the, f the fact that anyone, any single fisher on a boat could come home with 20 fish and seven of those, I think it's seven of those a snapper, is just outrageous. I, you know, th it's no longer just a, a feed for a family. This is just um, extreme... Um, consumption or extreme, extreme removal or extraction of a bio, biological resource that's there for everyone to share. 
So there are some really major problems. And the other problem is that there's no good logging or tracking of how much take the recreational fishers are, are taking. Um, estimates are that they're taking more than the commercial fishery as well. So the impacts of many individuals is very, very high in the Hadoki Gulf. Again, we're not, this isn't unusual um, around the world. This is a, a graphic, if you look in the bottom left hand corner is the year, of when the year in which fisheries have become overexploited globally. And you'll see by early, in the early 2000s, there is no fishery left in the world. These are commercial fisheries that are not overexploited and effectively unsustainable. So the pressure on the Gulf is mirrored to the pressure that we see globally. So um, we have to do something to, to try to repair this. It's very hard to do um, when some of the major predators are being removed. Just last week there was the um, big Tarakihi scandal, or scandal where we just come to the realisation that it's not being fished sustainably. It used to be one of the sustainable fish, fisheries. In my lifetime, pretty well, I've heard, I've heard every fishery is sustainable and eventually it becomes unsustainable. And it started, my, my awareness of this started with the Orange Ruffy fishery in the 1970s. <clears throat> and, and how it collapsed by the 1980s, um, mainly through over-exploitation and, the, and the, um, the, the massive pressure by big commercial fleets particularly, but also, as I said, recreational fishers can have on a system. Um, it's very hard to manage snapper um, stocks when recruitment into the fishery happens very episodically when you get large numbers of snapper coming in and replenishing the, the older snapper that, are, that have left. Um, that have been caught or died, and um, it, that happens every five to nine years, depending on a whole range of um, events, a series of events, whereas we're mostly targeting and catching fish that are only about three years old. So you realise that if you're doing that over several years, it may be a long time before that fishery can recover. Similarly with the rock lobster, effectively fished out of the Hodaki Gulf, and the impacts that all these things are having on the whole ecology of the Gulf, Gulf and what, we might, what might happen. I know this is not a concept new to most of you, or probably none of you, is the tragedy of the commons, where the resource that we have out there, the Haraki Gulf, the jewel, in our, the jewel of um, Tamaki, is um, really a tragedy of the commons that's seen all around the world, where no single, there's no single ownership of the Gulf, and everyone feels they have a right to, to extract something or take some of, the, some of the value out of the Gulf. This is a mindset we have to try to shift, to um, start thinking about the Gulf as a, as a whole unit that needs to be supported and managed to help it you know, on the road to recovery. And Dan's going to start to talk to us about that. Anyone who's seen me talk before knows I'm a big advocate of marine reserves. Um, marine reserves work really well because you can, you can, you can um, stop fishing in a certain area, allow the larger uh, larger individuals to grow and develop, which are the most reproductively valuable assets to fish populations or marine populations in general. So it's the big fat females that contribute the most to recovery of marine systems. They work really well because the dispersal phase of most marine organisms is actually during the larval phase. So you could fish out one of these little, little islands and then get, get it replenished from a marine reserve on another island because the larvae will travel that distance and replenish it. In um, the Haraki Gulf, our marine reserve network is trivial, to say the least. There's a, there's a de facto marine reserve through the um, cable zone, the protection zone, but then all those little green patches you can barely see from where you're sitting um, are our marine reserve network um, in, in the Haraki Gulf. Through the um, sea change process, there was a proposal to increase those marine reserves. And I have to say the process was underwhelming because effectively it was a group of stakeholders that still stuck to their own territorial interests or sectorial interests rather than thinking about the needs of the Haraka Gulf and the restoration of the Haraka Gulf. And they gave up some, some of their area that they could, um, would, would be prepared to give up for the benefit of the Gulf, but it was nowhere near enough, and also not based on any evidence that they were actually representative of, um, of the biodiversity of the Gulf and the habitats that needed protecting. It's very hard, that marine reserve protection is one of the biggest challenges in the world because no one want, everyone agrees that marine reserves, well, a lot of people agree that marine reserves are a valuable asset for the recovery of marine, marine species. 
in marine communities. The problem is no one wants to give up their favourite fishing spot as a marine reserve. And we've got to stop thinking about individual needs for the benefit of the environment, particularly the, the marine environment, and also for the, for the community benefits as well. I do want to acknowledge the Hardaka Golf Forum, as I said before, to setting a, a, a good target of 20%. Um, science, the science, um, the best science we have at the moment indicates that 30% is actually a target that means the loss of area that you have from protecting a marine reserves compensates for the loss of that area by increase the biomass in the areas outside of the reserve. It's quite. Um, there's some neat, neat experiments that have been done in the Great Barrier Reef and other areas that have shown that basically you, you trade off some areas as a marine reserve and you get all that back and more um, in the rest of the marine environment. It doesn't mean you don't have to do, use fisheries management tools as well. It's not a proxy for fisheries management tools, but it supports the management of marine environments. There's a whole... Marine reserves is, is a complex of terminology and... Um, for me, um, the most beneficial marine reserves are no-take marine reserves. We are challenged here in New Zealand is that the only way you can establish a marine reserve is for scientific research, to support scientific research. It's not about protecting the environment or recovery of marine communities. So that we have a big challenge in, in rewriting the legislation to make sure that, ha to, to start acknowledging that there's more to the environment than um, just a fisheries need or a fish extraction need and it's actually a, 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 an environmental management need. There's a lot of traditional um, terminology around um, marine protection and recovery of marine areas. Um, Raywin will be talking about some of the um, so how some of these work later, so I'm not going to go into them in detail. But one, one idea that I do like quite, quite a lot, Rahu has been set up quite a lot around, around the country, is um, the, the uh, sort of... Um, the dynamic Rahui concept, where you might have a Rahui over a period of time to help support a species that is spawning. So in finishing up, I just want to talk about three examples where small steps are being taken to try to help, help it recover, the Haraka Golf recover. So we heard Moana talk earlier about Akahu Bay, and just this month the last mooring was removed. What was happening was the, the benthos, or the, 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 the sand below those mooring, uh, moorings, were, being, were basically dead zones because of the, um, the anti-fouling that was coming off the boat. So the best maintained boats, uh, Dan tells me, the, the, the worst impacts were around the best maintained boats because all that, all that uh, anti-fouling was running straight to the bottom. So this is the beginning of a change for the, uh, for the Akahu Bay in the recovery of Akahu Bay. The noises, um, the new router family and the great work they're doing, um, the noises um, is a, a group of small predator-free islands in the sort of margin of the inner and outer Hauraki Gulf, so it's actually in a really um, important zone within the Gulf and has real potential for marine protection. Um, they've, been, they've been doing a lot of work um, and the impacts on the, on the Gulf, particularly under the water, have been many and varied. In their lifetimes they've seen massive changes both on the coasts and under the water area and also in terms of sedimentation and the water clarity around the Gulf, and, they, and they're really keen to, to shift that and start turning it around. They've done a lot of restoration projects both on land and under the water, and their goal is to actually help the, help the marine environment recover as well. So um, they're, supporting a lot of, they're supporting research activities out there for the rest recovery of the spotted shag as well, and, um, and there's, you will see in the media about all of these, but I think I hat goes off to um, this family who have um, done more for the noises than um, anyone can imagine and hopefully for the Gulf as well in time. So, but their challenge is trying to establish some sort of marine protection around, around the uh, noises. And finally, this is what a lot of people think the Gulf looks like under the water, but actually most of it looks like this. It's highly degraded, um, very little um, habitat, three-dimensional habitat available, and the impacts are many. Over, over several generations, and it's through um, scouring the bottom, whether it's for scallops or for any other, or fish, um, that has left the habitat pretty well as a, as a, mono, as a, a muddy, uh, smooth bottom, which means that there's no protection for the juvenile fishes and fi species that we're interested in 
for um, recovery, but also sedimentation loads. Um, part of the problem with the mussel bed restoration is that they, they lay the mussels down and they get smothered by sediment, so it's really hard to, to keep that going. But I have to say that the, um, the Revive the Gulf Shellfish Recovery Program is one of the other highlights of the Gulf and another great ambition for the Hanukkah Gulf Forum to try to re restore the Gulf and build up three-dimensional habitat in the Gulf, which is so important for particularly juvenile and other species that live in the Gulf as well. So what, what I see as key contributors to all this is, it's in a way for me, I'm, I'm disappointed that it's central government and to, some, and to some extent local government are actually falling behind. A lot of these initiatives and changes to the Gulf and improvements to the Gulf are actually being led by community groups, private landowners and iwi. And so we've seen some of the benefits of that coming out through ground up um, changes. So we've really got to think about how we might enact that and make it, a, make it more possible through legislative frameworks as well. We know what the problems are, we know where they're occurring. The big question is how do we fix it? And so now I'm going to hand over to Dan. And um, for me, the big thing is trying to connect all this and try to build the bottom up and the top down so they're all singing in the same tune. So thank you. Ia koutou katoa i te whakatuwharatia te te hui nei, a tēnā koe. Koutou katoa ko tai mai tēnā koutou katoa hoki. Ngā mihi mā te whare wānanga ki tāma ki Paingahira. Ngā mihi ki te moana i hora nei ko te waitimata ko te kapa moana te moana nui a tai hoki. O ko au he uri o Ngāti Maniapoto o Waikato Tainui me nā te whananga hoki a nō reira i rungi te mana o oku a tupuna a tēnā koutou katoa. So Tom lays out a pretty dire scenario for us and I'm afraid the news isn't going to get much better from me either. But what I hope to show is that there are some encouraging things moving through and in particular I'm going to talk a little bit about mātauranga Māori and the role that it might play and the role that it is already playing in achieving our vision and our dreams and aspirations for, for the Hauraki Gulf. I've chosen uh, the term restoring Māori for my presentation as it, it, it's a term that's popping up in many places. Uh, I saw it quite prevalent in the sea change, Taitumu Tai Party Marine Spatial Plan, uh, and then from there places like GIFT have picked it up. And it also dominated a lot of the discussion uh, amongst kaitiaki, amongst people working on the ground, and it's a term that I think, although it's Māori in origin, I think it's universal in its understanding. So of course, you know, the reason we're all here today uh, is, is what we see behind us, or behind you, and, and out in the, in, in the gulf there, the gulf itself. And what we're aiming to do is, is to turn its health around, is to restore its, its Māori. And, and part of that is, is mātauranga. And, and mātauranga Māori, or, or the indigenous uh, knowledge of, of the indigenous peoples of New Zealand, it spans both that knowledge as well as the values and the worldview and the culture. And a Māori worldview has that, because we've all come from the primal parents, uh, Rangi and Papa, everything we see in the taiao, everything we see around us, is interconnected. And we also draw our identity from the land, from the ocean, from the forests. Now that knowledge, of course, has been compiled through generations, uh, bought with a system of generating knowledge from Polynesia down to Aotearoa, where we became Māori. The land and the oceans made us Māori when we were here. And as part of that system, it isn't just a Google-type knowledge base where you just learn things and pass it down, wrote, through generations, there are mechanisms built in to test and to continually see whether the veracity of that knowledge was, was still held, to see whether things uh, might have changed because of being part of a dynamic system, it anticipates that change is the only constant. And so you need to have within your system of knowledge a mechanism to note that change and then embed that in once you recognise it is actually 
uh, there for the long haul. Now, Mātauranga Māori is codified in many forms, and of course we didn't have a written uh, language, and so it's expressed in things like whakatauaki and proverbs, in more teatea and chants and oriori, other forms of chants, in songs and waiata, in, in story form, as pūrāko, and of course story, the story form is a tried and tested method for getting knowledge passed down uh, through generations. <coughs> Excuse me. And also, of course, in, in Maramataka, the knowledge around the Māori lunar calendar, which is its temporal uh, metronome, as it were, and then the activities that were determined to be best suited for any particular day or, as it should be, night of the Maramataka. As, as Moana mentioned to us this morning, you know, because there are 26 mana whenua around the Hauraki Gulf, to me that, that means there are 26 bodies of knowledge, there are 26 ways of doing and being that we can draw from to better understand what is happening to the Gulf, what it used to be like and how we might move forward. There are more material ways that mātauranga Māori can be manifest as well and I've, I've chosen this example. This is of course easily recognised as a whare nui. This is in fact uh, umutahi whare nui, uh, mai matata, uh, down in the Bay of Plenty. And this image incorporates and I think uh, demonstrates mātauranga Māori very well. There is the knowledge of the design of the house, there is the knowledge of the materials that you'd use to to build the house out of, particular timbers that would be on the outside that are more resistant to the weather, uh, the materials that would use for the tukutuku panels, and then of course uh, the ochres, the traditional ochres that you would have used. To be honest, this is probably, I don't know, resin red or you know, wattles white or something, I'm not sure. Uh, but those colours uh, are colours that came from the earth, that came from Papa Tunuku herself. Uh, the whites can come from geothermal clays and muds. The reds can have a geothermal source or they could be uh, an oxidised form of, of sedimentary rocks. And the blacks have a number of various forms. With, with links to the ocean, uh, the anoxic muds that, that maybe that marine biologist you were talking about, that she said, trust me, my marine biologist just the other day, Elizabeth, those, those deep black muds are one of those forms of ochres. So what I'm talking about is, is the material part, the knowledge part, but that knowledge exists within a way of knowing and being in the world, and part of that is the world view. So if I've, if I've planned correctly and you're following good learning pedagogy and you're reading the slide right now, I'm going to draw out a few of the salient points. A, a world view determines what you believe to be possible, what you believe to be real and what you believe to be impossible, things that literally just can't happen. And we all have one. But what's interesting is that there is kind of a dominant worldview which is so dominant uh, that it becomes almost invisible to those who are within it. And it's only when others who have a slightly different worldview uh, try and put their voice up that you can begin to recognise that, oh, maybe I do have one of those. And so to give you an example of of what we might believe to be real, what we might believe to be possible. Remember this time? Now this is just an example that that was believed once upon a time and so the idea that a worldview in some ways limits what we can believe or not believe. Now, I know we're talking about the Hauraki Gulf but in the example I'm trying to give to explain this other concept which is very prominent in, in Māori thinking, Māori, I've, I've used this example, this of course falls just outside of the Hauraki Gulf Marine Park. This is the MV Rena that ran aground on, on what's called on most maps the Astrolab Reef on account of the Astrolab ship which ran aground there some hundred years ago or so. They just didn't seem to learn their lesson. Its original name was Otaiti. And when this ran aground, there were a number of, of effects in the environment. And look, this is just, just one image depicting that. Now, if any of you uh, sitting in your lounges at home when this was being broadcast across the TV, if any of you felt something when you saw these images, 
are like I did. And I, I was brought to tears by, by these types of images. You know, that feeling's real. And although we don't really have a scientific uh, term for it, we call it Modi. You sensed an impact to that environment that moved you in some way. And so hence, although as I said before, the word Modi is a Maori word. I believe it's, it's a universal concept. I believe it's something we can all feel. And Modi is, is explained as, as the life-supporting capacity of, of water, of soil. Uh, forests can have Modi and a tree can have Modi. Uh, it's also explained as, as the, the bond between the spiritual and the physical. So for animate objects, you know, when that bond is severed, uh, that's otherwise known as death. And so Modi was the, the force that, that bound those two together. Very wise Tohunga Aririata Makiha, known to many of you, no doubt, in the audience here, he describes Modi as a matangaro, or the invisible face. Modi isn't something that you can touch. Modi isn't something you can put your hand on. Modi isn't something that you can, you can put into a bottle. But it's, it's the things that you can sense, and it's an intuitive uh, part of understanding things. And it's the indicators uh, that give us a sense of whether the Modi is, is good or not. And so it's important to draw upon a point that Tom made around this shifting baselines notion, whereby uh, you may go out onto the golf and you think, oh, this is actually looking really good. Now, that might be in part because of your lived life experience. Now, science can uh, extend us back a little bit into the past to give us some ideas, and in fact, some of those photographs that Tom shared were a pretty good sense of what the modi of the golf used to be like. But that's where Mātauranga Māori plays another important role because it goes back centuries and the knowledge therefore greatly increases the temporality that we can draw from to begin to understand if we are about restoring or revitalising the Māori of the Hauraki Gulf, what did it used to be like? What could it be like? And I was also encouraged to hear that Tamaki Makoto, of course, you know, often translated as quite you know, poetic, Auckland of a, of a thousand lovers, uh -huh. but the notion of abundance, I think, is quite a prominent one here. So we know our golf is important. It's that important that it even got its own act, and it got a park created, and Hauraki Golf Forum, of course, hosting this event today, and then we have the Come park up, here, yeah. and one of the important things they do is create the state of the golf uh, reports and out of some of the uh, alarming information coming forth from those reports, they decided they would embark yeah. on a marine spatial planning process, a sea change, Taitumu, Taipati. The main message that we have got out of those successive State of the Hauraki Gulf reports is one of environmental decline. And Tom's uh, mentioned that in a little bit more detail than I'm going to, but arguably the two greatest impacts I can see are overfishing and the sediment runoff coming off the land. And so hence, interestingly, even though we're talking about the Gulf, actually what we're doing on the land has a significant impact upon what happens in the Gulf. And the challenge is that there is a legislative oversight which doesn't seem to remind us that what happens on land will often end up in the ocean. Whereas a Māori framing, notions of kiotiki tai from, from the mountains to the sea is an important integral part of that framing. So what happens when we overfish? Tom has already shown us this. We get these things called kinabarans. And so when you remove the snapper and you remove the crayfish, this is one of the examples. And, and interestingly, uh, my daughter saw this and said, oh, Dad. Mean as, heaps of kinners, where's that? And I said, well, that's, that's true, darling. I said, but if you crack those kinners open, because they have no food, uh, their, their, their gonads are all, you know, really dark in colour and they don't smell very nice. And, and she got a real sense of, oh, an understanding of, even though this looks abundant, this is actually, in terms of modi, really, really low modi. And then, of course... The other main impact we have uh, into the Hauraki Gulf is, is sediment. So the activities that we do on land are impacting what, 
what occurs in the oceans. And so we can get all sorts of measurements if we need to look at how bad that is. I mean, but you can tell this is just a suffocating blanket of clay and mud that's going to make life pretty difficult for anything uh, lying offshore there, if not impossible. And so that's when the term of Modi really comes into play. We can just look at this and sense that the Modi of that environment is not okay. So therefore we need to be doing something different to try and uh, stop what is happening there. And not only do we get sediment coming down, but often we'll get heavy metals incorporated into that sediment. We're getting heavy metals running off Tamaki Drive. So that's the next thing we have to do, Moana, is to get all those heavy metal off brake pads instead of washing down onto Okahu Bay. We need to trap that somehow. There's some pretty good ideas. Muscle shells are actually really good at filtering out those heavy metals. And sadly, because of, of ageing infrastructure, and, and one of our infrastructure ideas was that we put wastewater and stormwater next to one another, uh, that means when we get an average rainfall event in Auckland, uh, many of our beaches get closed. And so because of health impacts of sediment and perhaps pathogens and E. coli, we have a real issue at our hands. So it was very encouraging to see the Hauraki Girl Forum saying, hey, look, we've... we've diagnose the problem almost ad nauseum. We actually need to take a stand. We need to start trying to do things. So I was very encouraged to see that they have a vision of 20% of marine protected areas. And now by my calculations, that's about, of a 12,000 kilometre square marine uh, park, that's about 2,400 square kilometres. And that's roughly the area that I've depicted on, on the slide here. And, and apologies if someone else has got a similar slide later on today. But I just wanted to point out that, you know, that's, Given the challenges we have already about trying to get marine protected areas, whatever that might look like, that's a significant amount of space we need to be looking at. The other thing to bear in mind is why we try and create marine protected areas and where they have the most effect. And so places like Ōtata, like the noises, where there is already the diversity, where there is, there is already, uh, the marine biologists tell me, a good mixing of currents. That is the ideal spot where we should be getting a marine protected area in place. We're already protecting the land, now we need to protect the ocean. And the other uh, bold aspirational target they have is for around about 1,000 square kilometres of mussel reef. And so this is a 100 kilometre by 10 kilometre strip uh, just put in there, just to give you an indication of, of what that might look like. Now, to be clear, this isn't where I'm saying I think they should be. This is just to give you a graphic representation of, of what a 1,000 square kilometres look like. But if we included all of that lower part of the, uh, the Firth of Thames and then swept around uh, underneath Waiheke and Rakino and, and through that area in Pōnui, where there used to be mussel reefs, you know, we would just be reinstating it to what it once was. Now, one of the interesting things and the differences between a legislative approach and a Mātauranga Māori approach is that a Mātauranga one doesn't talk about managing the environment, it talks about managing humans. It talks about managing what we do and the activities we do or, or don't do, as the case may be. And so Rahui, uh, as, as Tom mentioned, are a tried and tested method of managing human activity uh, with a mindset of managing for abundance. And so it isn't just about trying to lock us out, it's about trying to uh, restore abundance to, to these areas. So one of the interesting ha things that happened with the RENA, of course, was that they actually became a de facto marine protected area for a few years. And look what happens when you keep humans out of a system for a little while. I believe this photo was taken about three years after uh, the RENA. So this is actually, those, that superstructure is part of, of the RENA. So all we had to do there was keep humans out. Nothing else. Sadly, the opportunity to leverage off for that uh, was lost. And even though the Motiti Rohe Moana Trust, who I want to acknowledge here, has been a, a true guardian of, of the ocean and pushed hard to get protection, sadly they failed. Although... Uh, they did take their case uh, to the appeals court and that case is still pending but I believe they may be toward a resolution and interestingly 
they are using the Resource Management Act to manage the environment, manage the marine environment. And so this is still a moving space, but there could be some really interesting findings from that. Some of you, if you're keeping a watch of it, uh, may have seen uh, Minister Nash uh, be very upset in saying there's no way that this would happen on his watch. And so given I have uh, the stage for just a, a, a few brief 20 minutes, I felt it important to say that there is a really interesting and important work going on elsewhere around New Zealand, notions of looking at what blue economy could look like, and we believe that this could play a major uh, and important role. I'm just trying to reframe how we look at oceans, not just as a place where we extract things from or that we dump our sediment into, but rather we want to increase our relationship and re-establish our relationship with the Gulf. And I'm not going to steal any of your thunder, Chris, but what I did want to mention is that having Modi as the goal of the Gulf Innovation Fund together has changed conversations, has changed the way people think about things, and I believe fundamentally for the better. And so what might it look like? It looks like Okahu Bay is going to feature heavily today. It has already. Uh, this, is, this is an image from about two weeks ago where there were still four recalcitrant boat owners um, still had their boats there, but as you've seen already, all the, all the moorings are gone now. And uh, this, this is a, a vision for the Okahu catchment that, was, uh, that Moana and, and my other dear friend, Richelle Kahui McConnell, were involved with creating with that community. And the notion is, is that once this has been realised, the Modi will have been restored to Okahu Bay. And so work in part that I had students do back in the uh, 2010 that identified those, those uh, metals in the sediments and works that work that we've been doing since then by looking at are the kaimawana there and if they are there are they safe to eat and if we can stop the sediment running into the water and if we can stop the heavy metals uh, maybe we might go in some way to restoring the Modi. But then of course let's not forget the mussels that have been placed off there and that's not my story to tell but in my mind Okahu Bay could be a microcosm for what we plan to do for the rest of the Hauraki Gulf. Nō reira, um, kia ora mai tātou katoa. <laughs>